may be seated. Megaly, if you'll get the tape. Appreciate that. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're in a very exciting passage tonight. Uh, we're looking at chapter 6, the first three verses. I'll be reading the uh, entire uh, first seven verses out of that chapter. Uh, but uh, tonight we have a very exciting beginning of a series looking at the offices of deacons and then to compare them and contrast them. We'll also be looking at the office of elder and how does that relate to pastors and the gift of pastor teacher. But we're in Acts and we're in chapter 6 tonight and I hope that it will be a, a very enlightening and beneficial study as we look at these very important church offices. Uh, churches cannot function uh, if they do not have appropriate church leadership and it's important for us to know how God uh, has set those offices out for us so that we might be better able to fulfill the ministries that God gives to each local church. We're in Acts chapter 6 and tonight we'll be looking, the Lord willing, at the first seven verses. Uh, we're looking at three but we'll read seven. Before we begin though, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the privilege of being able to study your word once again. It is your word, it is not our word, it's not the word of man, but the word of God. We pray that you'll help us to understand it rightly, to apply it properly, and then to live in a way that uh, is in harmony with the word of God. We pray, Father, that you will cause the going forth of your word tonight, not return void, but to accomplish that which you please, and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. We pray for your blessings on this, your word tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall that last week we were looking at pragmatic politics and powerful preachers, or we might subtitle it Gamaliel and the Mob, in Acts chapter 5, verses 34 through 42. Uh, the apostles have been arrested now for a second time in that portion of Scripture, and uh, it's rather interesting that this particular uh, event occurs immediately before we see the trouble arising in Acts chapter 6. Uh, Gamaliel has taken uh, the political control of the Sanhedrin in this little section of the text here uh, and has suggested uh, a mob activity. He suggested that what they need to do is figure out, or the Sanhedrin has decided they want to figure out a way to kill the disciples, and Gamaliel has stepped in and said, well, why don't we try something else? Let's see if we can't intimidate them. Uh, and he uses a, a political ploy whereby he gains a few points with the Sadducees, as we saw last week, but it's a ploy that later backfires on him and produces uh, the bitter hatred that Gamaliel has and passes on to his pupil, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, a Saul of Tarsus, uh, who was a student of Gamaliel, according to Paul's own words, sat at his feet, Gamaliel being one of the seven greatest rabbis in Jewish history, and still they consider him so to be. So he's no friend of Christian, he's embarrassed by the results of ultimately what turns out, and uh, then we find his student, Saul of Tarsus, persecuting the Christians later on. We saw he was a doctor of the law, not merely Jewish law, but of rabbinic law. Not talking about the Mosaic law of the Old Testament, we looked at a little bit of that this morning, but a man who was very skilled in all of the technicalities that the Jews had added to the law, the hedge about the law, the incrustation whereby they sought to control the people and uh, use the uh, excuse that this was helping the people not to violate the law of Moses or the law of God. We saw that they were people pleasers. They, uh, this man Gamaliel himself is a man who was held in reputation among the people. And we saw that the Sanhedrin was a man-pleasing organization. Looked at many, many passages of that. But the basic principle is the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. That's Proverbs 29, verse 25. We find that there were those who on the Sanhedrin had trusted in Christ even during his earthly ministry, but because of the fear of man, they had grown up in that context. They refused to confess Christ, John chapter 12, verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. What a difference it would have made if some of those men had voiced their opinions, besides Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, as we know on the Sanhedrin, but others apparently believed also, but they never said anything. What a difference it would have made if those who were secret believers had spoken out in the times of test. And how many times we fail to speak out for our Lord because we are people placers, we are fearers of men rather than fearers 
of God. And verse 43 says they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Gamaliel had appealed to history. He, of course, had faulty reasoning because, of course, the apostles were neither tax protesters nor an insurrectionist movement. Those are the two examples that Gamaliel gave. But he did speak the truth when he said that uh, this might be of God. Of course, he's speaking of a supernatural God. He's not speaking of the God of the majority of the Sanhedrin, which were Sadducees, who were humanists, religious humanists, who merely believed in this life. They believed that when you were dead, you were dead. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the supernatural. They were humanists. And so, since they realized that putting these men in jail doesn't work, they can get out whenever they want to, instead they revert to uh, beating them back to intimidation, and the apostles uh, respond in a way which they also would not have expected. The apostles give thanks at suffering shame for the name of Christ. And we talked in detail about the principle that godly living and powerful preaching produces persecution. And we see that Paul tells us that in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, that all, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Peter goes into great detail in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12-19. through 19. We will not read that entire passage, but he reminds us that it is not, a strange, it is not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. And going back perhaps to this very incident, says, But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. And so we came to the conclusion that obedience to the highest authority is not rebellion or disobedience against lower authorities. We always must obey the higher authority. And that's what brings us to Acts chapter 6, and we propose to give an overview of the first three verses tonight, and then we'll be going on a week at a time as we take other verses and look at the context of what deacons are, what they're supposed to be doing, what kind of character they are supposed to have, and how they differ from elders, and perhaps even what are the keys that moves a man from the position of a deacon into the position of an elder. The Apostle Paul, in dealing with the matter of deacons in 1 Timothy chapter 3, explains to us that there is a, and use a very, very important technical word there, a very important step that a deacon may take, whereby he is moved from the office of deacon to the office of an elder. And so we begin in verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith." Very interesting conclusions to functioning in a proper and biblical manner. Now, as we begin our study tonight, perhaps the very first thing we should do is get a definition of deacons. This is a, a distillation and a summary of a number of years of study on this subject. We'll be going over all the passages that give us the, uh, the elements of this definition, but I'd like to at least give you a definition to start with as to what the term deacon means. The term deacon designates spiritually mature men who have faithfully exercised the gift of ministration and who are appointed to distribute the material donations of believers to meet the temporal needs in the assembly. Now there are a lot of parts to that and uh, it also deals with particularly one of the spiritual gifts, the gift of ministration, and we'll be talking about that as we move a little bit farther into our study. Uh, there were originally 22 spiritual gifts that were given in the New Testament, some of which were temporary gifts only during the apostolic age, seven of those in particular were gifts that were given only during the apostolic age, that related to the reception and transmission of new special revelation. 
But there are other gifts that were given to edify the body of Christ throughout this period in which we live. At least 15 other gifts are listed by the term charismata in the New Testament, and they are gifts by which the church functions today, and whereby each member of the body has a responsibility to minister to other members of the body in the exercise of those gifts. But the term deacon is an office, it's not a gift, but it is an office whereby one gift in particular comes to the forefront and which is exercised on a regular basis, and that is the gift of ministration. It also relates to the distribution of material donations of the believers to meet certain temporal needs in the assembly. We see widows in view here in Acts chapter 6. We'll find some other uh, ways in which this gift is used, or rather this office is used, when we get over to the passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3, which deals with both elders and deacons, and then we see more information is given to us in the book of Titus concerning elders. So we'll be able to see a contrast between these two different offices in the church. Now, as we look at the passage before us tonight, we find that this first appointment of deacons was based on three things. Number one, it's based on church growth. Number two, it's based on disharmony in the church. And number three, we see that it was putting the burden in the church was putting a secondary burden on those who were trying to minister the word. Three things are brought to our attention at the very beginning, in the first verse of this passage tonight. Now, it says, first of all, that the disciples were multiplied. That's church growth. If we had this kind of church growth, we couldn't fit this building. In fact, we'd probably have to hold around 10 services a week to be able to function the way that we really would need to function as we look at this particular large group of believers. It says the disciples were multiplied. We know that the apostles were trying to care for much more than 8,000 people by this time. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, it tells us that 3,000 were saved. And as we saw at that time, it's 3,000 Jewish males. Uh, we noted that from two different things. Number one, the term on air, which Peter uses throughout his sermon in Acts chapter 2, which is a term that refers only to males. He would have used anthropoi if he were, using, uh, if he were speaking to an audience of both men and women, but he does not. He uses the technical term for males there. We discovered also that their location of these men was in the courtyard of the men in the temple on the day of Pentecost. No women were allowed there. Uh, only the males were allowed there. And um, that was another sermon. You can get the tape if you did not hear it. Uh, but 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. We get over to Acts chapter 4. We find 5,000 more are saved. It says in Acts 4, verses 1 through 4, As they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people, and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them, and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit, now this is the result of that sermon on that day that they got arrested. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Now that was one powerful preaching. <laughs> that was one powerful movement of the Holy Spirit. And God enabled them to get the full message out before they were arrested. Enough information was given on that sermon that 5,000 men believed and were saved. We've got 8,000 by that point. By the way, you'll notice that only men are mentioned in these two passages. It's very similar to the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, where again only males are mentioned. And by the way, the feeding of the 5,000 is one of the few things that is recorded in all four of the Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels, of course, record many of the same things, and the Gospel of John is different. But when we get to the feeding of the 5,000, even the Gospel of John records it, though he is choosing specific signs and specific miracles to undergird his theme that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Listen to what it says in Matthew 14, 21. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. Mark 6, 44. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. Luke 9, 14. For they were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, make them sit down in fifties and accompany him. John 6.10 And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. We find that in the 4,000, it's only males that are being listed to, Matthew 15.38. They that did eat were about 4,000 men beside women and children. So Jesus fed a lot more than the 5,000. We talk about feeding the 5,000 in one case. We talk about feeding the 4,000 in another case. It's 4,000 men 
Those are the guys with the big appetites. But you've also got women and children who are there as well. And I suspect that you could at least average it out where there was at least one woman or one child to balance off each of the men. So it's probably closer to the feeding of the 10 to 15,000 and the feeding of the 8 to 16,000 or 12,000 in that second passage. We also know that there are more than 8,000 because of what Acts 2, verses 46 and 47 says. Acts 2, 46 and 47 say, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and this is after the day of Pentecost, after the salvation of the 3,000, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Now listen to the last phrase. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. In other words, there was a daily evangelism going on as well. And God, choosing out his elect and drawing them to himself through the proclamation of the word, is every day adding to the church. They are meeting on a daily basis, and God is bringing in new souls into the church on that daily basis. We also know that there were many believing women as well as men. Of course, the initial group over in Acts chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, uh, tells us that there were an initial group of women who were there with the apostles. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of names together were about 120. So we have uh, an initial group of women who are gathered together with the apostles. We also know that there were women as we get to Acts chapter 5 because there was Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, Ananias had a wife, and she's mentioned in specific. A certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But we find that not only that is the case, there are also multitudes of both men and women added after Ananias and Sapphira had committed their sin. It tells us that Acts, uh, Acts 5.14, and believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes multitudes of both men and women. We've got a huge group of people by the time we get here to Acts chapter 6. We have a huge group of people that the apostles are ministering to on a daily basis. And they've got their hands full. All kinds of things are going on there in the temple area where they have been meeting. It's a, a gigantic area. And as we get to Acts chapter 6, the problem arises, which is a very big problem. And notice something else. It only deals with one segment of the women. It's only dealing with widows. It's not dealing with the married women. It's not dealing with single daughters under their parents' authority. And yet this need that we get to in Acts chapter 6 requires a gigantic, what we would call, church meeting. They're calling the entire multitude together. Perhaps somewhere between 12,000 and 6,000 people came to this meeting. That's a very large church. That's a very large meeting of people. It's a big problem that they are facing because it is a critical point in the life of the church whereby the church might be divided and might be destroyed in its infancy. Well, we'll talk about that in just a second. In fact, it's such a problem that the twelve apostles with all of their apostolic gifts could not handle that problem. They needed at least seven men who would spend full time on the problem. I think we probably have somewhere between 12 and 16,000 believers at this point, uh, one woman or one child being the average for uh, each man who has been mentioned, not, not even counting the men who are not specifically listed in the group of 3,000 or in the group of 5,000. Now I think there's some observations that we can see from this very first verse. The first observation, I've got at least 10 different observations on verse number one here is internal trouble follows a victory over external trouble. They've just had a victory over pressure from the outside. But you know, the devil never leaves you very long. When you have just had a spiritual victory in some area, he never leaves you very long before he brings a second punch. And he doesn't bring it in the same area because you've already learned how to handle it in that other area. Instead, he brings it in a different area. He had started with external pressure. The apostles didn't crumble. In fact, they ended up stronger than when they started. And so now he brings an internal problem to them. It's his double punch approach. So watch out for that. When you have a spiritual victory in your life, recognize that the devil has not forgotten you. 
recognize that there will be a second punch that follows up. The second thing I think that we see is the first internal attack was an attempt to cause division. The first attack on the inside workings of the church was an attempt to cause division. As you look back over the history of the church, think back all the times that Satan has attacked the church. What has he tried to do? He's tried to cause division. Oh, there are other kinds of attacks. There are people getting sick in the church. There are people having accidents in the church. There, but what does that do? That tends to bring the church closer together. People praying for one another. People ministering to one another. So what Satan wants to do, if he possibly can, is drive a wedge of division. How many times has that happened here? How many times has that happened in other churches where I've seen ministries that have gone on for years and years and the numbers of times that Satan has tried to cause division in the church? You know, that's where he started in Acts chapter 6. First internal attack was an attempt to cause division in the church. You know, unity produces power. Division causes weakness. And Satan knows that. The third attack that we see is in regard to women. You know, it's rather interesting. What was Satan's first attack in the Garden of Eden? It was against Eve, wasn't it? He looked for the weak link. Now, ladies, you don't have to think of yourselves in an inferior light when you think in terms of weakness. The Apostle Paul explains that. Uh, man is the one who is designed to take the brunt of the blows. The woman is the weaker vessel. Men are designed to protect and to guard and care for and love and cherish their wives. So where does Satan, in this very first attack on the church, where does Satan try to attack? He attacks women. In fact, he attacks some of the weakest women in the church. Those, those who are widows, those who do not have a man figure who is caring for them and providing for them. This first attack also, I look at it and I say, you know what we've got here is an entitlement issue. Someone who's expecting something was neglected. Now, there's a real responsibility in the church to care for its widows. But you know, we see this kind of entitlement mentality flowing over to other areas and into our society whereby people are expecting something from somebody as a handout and it becomes an entitlement mentality which if they don't get it, there's a murmuring and a grumbling and a complaining, and we see that's what happens here in the church in Acts chapter 6. The next thing that we see is the neglected people were the most helpless and the ones drawing the greatest sympathy. You know, when Satan tries to cause division like this, uh, he never tries to get us to feel sympathy for Nazis or skinheads or communists or, you know, rabble-rousers or drug people who are out throwing bombs at churches. Those are not the people you feel sympathy for. Where does he put his pressure? He always chooses something good and tries to use it in the wrong way. That's Satan's method. He doesn't choose all the bad stuff. You know, we, we can look out there in the gutter and see somebody who is, you know, on drugs and having hallucinations, and we are not tempted to go that direction. Or at least I hope you're not. Instead, what's he choose here? He chooses those who have the greatest sympathy drawing card. Notice something else. It's a daily need. You know, you and I have probably on occasion helped somebody out uh, who had a genuine need. But, you know, if that person kept coming back to you every day, every day, every day, day after day, would you get tired of it after a while? <laughs> I think so. I've had people in my ministry who, you know, 37 years of ministry, I look back and I see hordes of people who are that way. You know, they found once they've got what they consider a soft touch, they come back to you and 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 back to you. And, back to you. and I know Brother Coleman has probably experienced this same kind of thing too. It's like they never give up. You know, and, and the more you give out, the more they come. And the more you try to help them, the more they want. Here's a situation which is a daily need. You know, all of us here like to eat three square meals a day. And did you know widows like to eat three square meals a day too? It's a need that is on a daily basis. It's the kind of interruption that breaks into your day and makes it hard to do other things. Not that it's bad, but it's there. 
know how often I, I go over to my study early in the morning, sometimes very, very early in the morning, just so I can get a start on the day before the interruptions start. And they come. That phone rings off the hook. And if I go out, you know, I don't give people my cell phone number, but my wife has my cell phone number, and when they call, they'll call my wife, my wife calls me, then I have to take care of a problem. Um, folks, it's part of the ministry, and those of us who are in it know that goes with the territory. But it does make it hard to do certain aspects of ministry which the apostles understand here and which they prioritize, as we'll talk about in a few moments. The need here is not only a daily need, it's a survival need. It's not merely something that you wish you could take a shower every day, but since we're low on water and the water table is down, uh, the, the city has asked us to take showers only every other day. You know, This is a survival need. If you don't eat, you don't live. The need is also a humble need. It's not a high-profile, big-shot, honor-absorbing call to work that we have the apostles giving here. It's not, you know, come forward and we will put you on a pedestal and you'll be able to, you know, really soak up the glory from the congregation. That's what Ananias and Sapphira had tried to do back in Acts chapter 5. This is a humble need. In fact, it's called ministration here in the text. The word ministration... Diokonia means service, the attendance upon someone else as a servant. In fact, not merely serving someone else. It's not like you get to be, say, the king's cupbearer like Nehemiah was, so you happen to be rubbing shoulders with royalty all the time, and you're a highly trusted, respected person, and so you're able to come in, you know, before the king and hand him his cup, and, you know, he trusts you, and, you know, you're getting to hear what's going on in the court. No, no. This is humble service to those who at that time were at the very bottom of society. This is humbly serving those who were widows. We're going to talk about that, about the office of a deacon and the other technical requirements that are given in 1 Timothy chapter 3, but notice it here. We find also this first attack tried to divide the believers along national lines. All of them are Jews up to this point, but according to Acts chapter 2, we find that there were at least 18 different dialects that were listed that the apostles spoke these different languages. These were re religious Jews, righteous Jews, who had come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost to fulfill the responsibilities that had been set forth for them in the Old Testament law. So we find that there are people who are Greek-speaking Jews among them, and they are the ones, these widows, who are neglected in the daily ministration. So Satan is trying to divide along national lines, and you know we see that he has done that throughout history. He sought to divide the body of Christ along ethnic lines, national lines, racial lines, sought to cause us to hate one another simply because of the color of our skin or the background from which we came. We find that kind of a division is going on here as well. And then we find something else. The division produced sin in the assembly. The division produced sin in the assembly. It says they murmured. There was a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily administration. It doesn't say the widows were murmuring. It says because their widows were neglected in the daily administration. There were others in this assembly, perhaps men, perhaps married couples, perhaps couples with children, who didn't want to be burdened with it because they felt like they had their own responsibilities and they didn't want to give out something extra just for our widows. Instead, they murmured against the apostles. They murmured against what the church was doing for their widows. They saw somebody else getting something that their widows weren't getting. That's sin, folks. You know, when you look at murmuring, you can trace it all the way back to the Old Testament. Just going to read you a few verses. We find the children of Israel murmuring in the wilderness. In the, morning, in the morning, then you shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? You see... The congregation was murmuring against Moses and Aaron. Here we find the congregation murmuring against the twelve apostles. And as Moses said, you're not murmuring against us, you're murmuring against God. 
when you do that kind of murmuring. Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Satan had learned a few things out of that Old Testament experience. He had seen how God had chastened and judged the children of Israel. We find that after ten times of murmuring in the wilderness, God finally said, That's enough. And he killed them. Now Satan has just seen God killing some people in the church. And he thinks to himself, how else can I get God to get rid of some of these Christians? You know, we've got way too many Christians. This is growing too fast. We've got to put a stop to this movement. I've got it. What did God do in the Old Testament when the children of Israel murmured against him? Why, he wiped them out. Hey, that's a great idea. Let's see if we can get a little murmuring, a little complaining, a little griping against the leadership in the church because the way God looks at that, since he put the leaders there, since they're his intermediaries, therefore that murmuring is not against them, that murmuring is against God, and God defends his own name. So God will take care of that. Numbers chapter 14, 27, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. That's God speaking. Verse 36, And the man which Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander against the land, died. Hmm. That's the way God deals with it. Number 16, For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord, and what is Aaron that you murmur against him? Numbers 14, 29, Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to the, your whole number from twenty years old and upward which have murmured against me. God takes murmuring and griping and complaining very seriously. And Satan managed at the very inception of the church here, at the very infancy, to bring the sin of murmuring into the congregation because there was a genuine need, it was a daily need, it was a survival need, it was something whereby they said, we've got to take care of this right away. But instead of handling it in a proper manner, the old sin nature began to creep out and the murmuring took place. 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyers. Now, you know when problems arise in the church, action has to be taken. And if action is not taken, and taken immediately, you will find that a problem begins to grow. And so what do we see the solution of the apostles? Number one was an immediate call to action. They gathered the whole church together. Everybody was on the same page from the get-go. They didn't say, well, let's call together uh, you know, a few of the guys out here and see if we can brainstorm and come up with some solutions, and then we'll sort of pass it on to our small groups. No, no, that's not what happened. They called the entire assembly, the entire multitude, together. That was a big church meeting. The second thing is they involved the entire congregation in it. You know, it's, uh, it wasn't just a matter of, well, now, you know, we're going to, uh, we're telling all you guys this, but now what we're going to do is we're going to go around and we're going to hold interviews. Uh, each one of us, 12, is going to hold interviews. Anybody who wants to volunteer, come forward. We'll hold an interview with you, and after we've held an interview, then we'll go back into session again, and once we've met together and compared notes with each other, then we'll decide, no, that's not how they did it. They told the congregation, for you all to look for men who have these qualifications. We want you to do some legwork. We want you to be involved. You know, we've got a problem in the church. It's not just a matter for the leadership. It's a matter for everybody to say, look, we have to be involved in this as well. The third thing that they did was they set priorities for those involved in spiritual service. You know, they had responsibilities that Satan would have loved to have destroyed. Prayer and the ministry of the word. You know, it is so easy... And sometimes fun to get involved in things that just absorb massive amounts of time, but don't get to the heart of the issue, which is prayer and the ministry of the word for those who are in positions of spiritual leadership in the church. I tell you, there's so many fun things around here that I like to do in terms of the buildings. Uh, and uh, we've gotten involved in that, and Brother Dan has gotten involved in that. Um, and, but those things were for the proclamation of the word, to make the word go out. Tonight, this broadcast is being spread over the Internet worldwide for all those who will tune in and listen to it. And it's available 24 hours a day on the web. In other words, it's being recorded now and broadcast live now. But uh, if you go on that website, you'll be able to see this morning's service. You'll be able to see this evening's service. You'll be able to see them 24 hours a day. Uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, Tuesday morning, you tune in, you'll get one of the services that we had today. 
this is a, an outreach that we're trying to get outside the four walls of the building. But you know, there comes a time when all those extra things have to be set aside for the purpose of the Word of God and prayer. The preparation of sermons. You may not think it takes very long for somebody who's been in the ministry almost 40 years to prepare a message, but I prepare my messages always fresh. I don't just go back and pull out some notes and then I rehash those notes uh, to you. Uh, no, that's a very good way to become very dull very quickly. Every message is prepared fresh. It takes time to study the Word of God. It takes time to pray. It takes time as you begin to see that there are other connections to other portions of Scripture and they begin to tie together. And hopefully, over the years, a pastor's messages will begin to mature as more things are added to them. And so the apostles set priorities. The fourth thing, there were some goals that were set. There was a work of examination and reporting back to the apostles as they gave that assignment to the congregation. And finally, there was the right of retaining a veto or the right of appointment. You look, we appoint. It wasn't a congregational vote here, by the way. You'll notice that. You won't find that anywhere in the scriptures about congregational voting things. Instead, you find that they looked for men with these qualifications, and then it was the apostles who appointed them, and that's emphasized a little bit later on in the text as well. Now, we have seven men who are being chosen here in this passage. That, of course, in scripture is the complete number. Now, that's the number of perfection. doesn't mean you always have to have seven deacons. Uh, you remember, you've got... <coughs> somewhere probably close to 16,000 people at least that are in the church, and you've got 7,000, excuse me, seven men who are going to take care of whatever that percentage of the widows were out of 16,000 people. Let's just take that as a round figure and pretend that there were 5% widows in the congregation. We have a higher percentage than that here in our church, uh, but let's assume that the church in its infancy only had 5% widows out of the number that were believers. That would mean that there were 800 widows in that church in Jerusalem. And each deacon was therefore responsible for caring for at least 100 widows every day to make sure that they were fed and cared for. You know, that's a full-time job. That is a full-time job. Now we look at that first list of qualifications that are given to us here in these first three verses. And they are spiritual qualifications, not merely temporal qualifications. The first thing that it says is that they had to be men of honest report. That is, these are people who have a reputation for being honest. These are people who are not coming up and volunteering and saying, yes, I'm honest, and the more they talk about their honesty, the faster you count your spoons. No, uh, these are people who have a, an external testimony that people report about them with the dealings with them about their honesty, of honest report. Did you know that's something the Apostle Paul emphasizes as we go through the New Testament doctrinal epistles? Of honest report. Why would they have to be of honest report? Because you see, these men were going to be handling money. These men were going to be dealing with the offerings and the gifts that the congregation brought for the meeting of the needs. They were not going to be men who stuck the money into their own pockets. Men who decided to do a little investing on the side and keep the proceeds for themselves. These were men of honest report. Paul says in Romans 12, 17, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. In other words, they have to be able to give an account. God can see your heart. God can see what you're doing in the dark, but people can't. So these have to be men who, who were men that would be qualified in the sight of other men, to be honest. 2 Corinthians 8.21 says, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7 says, Now I pray to God that she do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that she should do that which is honest, that we be as reprobates. No matter what people think of us, do what is honest. Some Christians have forgotten that today. We figure if we can get away with it, you know, then it's okay. If we can cheat just a little bit, it's okay. You know, it's like the fellow who, he uh, was always cheating his customers and a Christian came to him and witnessed to him over and over and he saw he was cheating his customers and finally he led him to Christ and uh, he said, now you really have to treat him uh, according to biblical principles you have to do, uh, you know, treat your customers honestly and so the Christian was in the shop the next day and a fellow came in and the, the shop owner just ripped the guy off terribly 
And when the guy left, uh, the Christian said, Now, you didn't do what the Bible says. He says, Oh, yes, I did. The Bible says he came and I took him in. <laughs> so, be careful. God's Word tells us we have to be honest. Listen to what Philippians says. Finally, brethren, here's Paul's conclusion. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whether they're, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. It's not only a matter of doing, it's a matter of your constant meditation and your thought life. Not looking for ways to get around the problem that would be dishonest or that would be cheating or that would somehow be slightly off color but think on things that are honest 1 Peter 2.12 having your conversation honest among the Gentiles that is your manner of life the unbelievers around you in the world how do they look at you do they say oh yeah he's a Christian yeah I know those guys those are the guys that go into church and they try to sell their product or whatever it is uh, you know put pressure on other Christians and they they don't really do it honestly they cheat and is that the kind of way the world looks at you? Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works. They see the way you live, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. First qualification that is listed here is a moral character qualification. Because these are men who are going to be dealing with material things, with things that would tempt others, and you know, this is something that tells you about their relationship to covetousness. We talked about that this morning. Covetousness, you've got to avoid it because covetousness, Paul says in Ephesians 5.5 5 and Colossians 3.5, covetousness is idolatry. The covetous man is an idolater. And God hates idolatry. We find all the way through the Old Testament people who came under the judgment of God because they committed idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry. That's a very serious issue in the sight of God. These have to be honest men. It tells you something on the flip side what they are not. These are not covetous men. You don't put a covetous man into this office. You don't put a man who's always grabbing and squeezing the rock to try to get a little more out for himself. That's the kind of man who's dangerous in handling church funds. The second qualification that we see is full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Now those are two separate things, being full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. And yet those two things are very closely connected together in Scripture. For example, you are familiar with Ephesians 5.18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. But you know what immediately precedes that? It says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Wisdom and the filling of the Spirit are both closely connected in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. And when you are filled with the Spirit, according to Galatians chapter 5, you will produce the visible fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those are things that the Holy Spirit, as you yield to Him and as He fills you, begin to appear in your life and become visible and evident to those around you. So when He says that these have got to be men who are full of the Holy Ghost, He is telling you that these are going to be men who manifest the fruit of the Spirit that is listed for us in Galatians chapter 5 before any deacon is ever placed into a position of authority or office in a church, he must be a man who is full of the Holy Ghost, not a man who is walking in the flesh. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is set in contrast with the works of the flesh. The man who is full of the Holy Ghost is not going to be manifesting the works of the flesh. Those are disqualifications for the office of deacon. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, strife, wrath, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. In other words, it's not a complete list. The works of the flesh is a very long list, and Paul didn't give us the entire list. He says, and of such like, there are a lot of other things that fit the list that are works of the flesh. So you can't just come up and say, oh, well, none of those particularly happen to be me, but 
And then you go off and list some other sin that you're involved in. No, the works of the flesh and such like, of which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So to be filled with the Spirit of God means coming under the control of the Spirit of God. As He controls you, He will fill you and produce the works of the Spirit, and those works of the Spirit drive out the works of the flesh. You cannot walk in the Spirit and in the flesh at the same time. That's very clear from Galatians chapter 5. A man is not qualified to be a deacon who walks in the flesh. He has to be a man who's walking in the Spirit, manifesting the fruit of the Spirit, avoiding the works of the flesh. He is under the control of the Spirit. That's what it means when it talks about being filled with the Spirit. That's not the indwelling of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells every person who has placed in his or her faith in Jesus Christ. But the filling of the Spirit deals with the control of the Holy Spirit in the daily life of the Christian. If you're filled with wine, which is the contrast here in Galatians 5, the wine affects how you think. The wine affects how you speak. The wine affects how you move your body and your muscles. He says, don't be controlled by wine, wherein is excess, but be controlled by the Spirit. Don't have some other kind of external control that comes in and makes you do things that are contrary to the will of God for your life. Very important qualification for one who is going to be a deacon, full of the Holy Ghost, not one who is walking in the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we're talking about being filled with the Spirit, we're talking about a man who is mortified, Colossians chapter 3, the deeds of the flesh. A man who is seeking those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Mortify, that is put to death, the deeds of the flesh. Folks, I'm afraid a lot of us have never gone through that process. does not mean you're going to be sinlessly perfect. Get that clear. Everybody who's a deacon, everybody who's an elder, everybody who's a pastor has sinned and does, on occasion, move into sin. But the response is immediate confession of sin, repentance of it, restoration if necessary, and walking back in fellowship and by faith in the power of the Spirit of God. But our goal is to walk in such a way that the Spirit of God is flowing through us continuously as He works to conform us to Christ and as He works to minister through us with the exercise of the gifts that God has given to us. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Crucifixion is a long and agonious death. And the old flesh keeps trying to get down off the cross. And we keep letting it down. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Your position and your practice have got to be coincidental with one another. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Oh, back to that business of wanting what the other person has. And then it says, full of wisdom. You know, as we look here in Acts chapter 6, we're going to have a very perfect illustration of that when we get to Acts chapter 7 with Stephen. Because it tells us that he was a man who was full of wisdom and of the Holy Ghost. He's the first man listed among the choices in Acts chapter 1, or excuse me, Acts chapter 6, verse 5. The saying pleased the whole multitude that chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor. Well, you know something? We find him not only full of faith, but it says he was also full of wisdom. It says, in fact, that he had so much wisdom that they couldn't resist the spirit by which he spake down here in verse 10 of Acts chapter 6. They were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spoke. Full of the spirit, full of wisdom. Both of them mentioned of Stephen in Acts chapter 6 verse 10. But as we look at wisdom, we find that wisdom is described and defined for us elsewhere in the New Testament. So when this passage, though it only gives us those few words where it says it has to be someone who is full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, if you want to know what God is speaking through the apostles here, they are speaking under the influence of the Spirit of God and speaking divine revelation, if you want to know what wisdom is that God is talking about, you look at the definitions that are found in the rest of the New Testament. 
A man who wants to have the office of a deacon must have these character qualities that are expressed in the New Testament as to what wisdom is. Number one, we find that he has to be someone who knows how to preach Jesus Christ. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Wisdom centers in Jesus Christ. He has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. It focuses on our Lord Jesus Christ. We find that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in fact, three verses in a row, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, mature, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Wisdom relates to divine revelation. Wisdom is not just merely a matter of being smart. Wisdom is not merely a matter of having lots of facts jammed into your head. Wisdom deals with revelation that God has given and the ability to apply divine wisdom to the practical realities of life. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. Where does it come from? Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. There we find the Holy Spirit again connected to wisdom, even as he is over here in Acts chapter 6. It's the things that the Spirit of God gives you understanding. We call it illumination. The scripture is already revealed. The scripture is finished. The scripture is final. But to understand it requires the working of the Holy Spirit of God so that we understand how God applies His Word to real life situations. Wisdom which the Holy Ghost teaches. We find the Apostle Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Now it's not merely a matter of learning psychology or psychiatry or learning the best ways to manipulate certain types of people who have certain character defects in them. The wisdom of God deals with the communication of the Word of God in the practical situations of life so that people get divine answers and not human answers to their problems. The Apostle Paul goes on, he speaks in Colossians chapter 1, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Wisdom is knowing the will of God. Do you know the will of God for your life? How many of you have gone through all the passages that talk about the will of God and made a list of all the things that he has revealed as his will for you. I did that many years ago because I really wanted to know the will of God. And I figured it's better to start with the revealed will of God so that I can someday come to the things that I am not quite sure about in terms of the will of God. When you do the things that are revealed will of God, God will lead you into other areas where through the spiritual wisdom and understanding of the word of God, he directs your ways. Wisdom is required and it is required of Christians in the power of the spirit and according to to the scriptures. For Colossians 1.28, speaking of Christ again, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Wisdom is moving toward maturity. That's what Paul's desire was, to teach them wisdom so that they could mature in Christ. That's what the word perfect, teleos, is driving at here. We find Colossians 2.3 again pointing to Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. How well do you know Jesus? You see, when we're talking about the calling of these deacons, we are talking about men who knew Christ and knew him in a close and personal and intimate way. These are men who are spiritually qualified. You know, we tend to think of, oh, well, the deacons, those are the guys who deal with the money, and the elders, those are the guys who have to be spiritual. No, the very first set of qualifications that are given for deacons here are spiritual qualifications, character qualifications, moral qualifications, qualifications that deal with defects that are very common in the church that they must not have. Paul goes on. 
He tells us something else about wisdom. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. It's someone who has the word of Christ dwelling in him richly. It's someone who is able to discern in the context here, music. Someone who has an understanding of what is spiritual and what is not. We have a horrible mixture in the church today of that which is spiritual and that which is carnal when it comes to music. Oh, we could spend all evening talking about that one. But it's mentioned here in Colossians 3, your deacons, how do they view psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord and using it for teaching and admonishing one another? Does the word of Christ dwell richly in them in all wisdom? We're told that we must walk in wisdom, all of us as believers, toward them that are without redeeming the time. Wisdom uses time well. It doesn't waste time. These are going to be men who are going to be busy all day long. They're going to have to deal with ladies who perhaps have many different kinds of problems, not just the need for some food. They've got to be men who are morally upright. We'll see that as we get over to 1 Timothy chapter 3, because they're dealing with single women. These are going to be godly men. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You can ask of God. You have to ask in faith. James goes on in that passage in James 1. And if you don't ask in faith, you're like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But if you don't have wisdom, if you aspire to the office of a deacon, you can ask God for wisdom, and God is delighted to give it to you. But that presupposes something. That presupposes that you are letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. God doesn't work in a vacuum. He doesn't drop wisdom into your head as you are sitting there slothfully on the couch, popping chocolates into your mouth and watching the, the latest banal TV program. You won't get wisdom that way. Wisdom comes as you study the Word of God and as the Spirit of God gives you understanding of the Scripture so that you can apply it to real life and help other people with it. James 3, 3, 13. Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. A man who is wise will have appropriate works and will be meek. Meekness, by the way, is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. Very interesting to do a study on meekness. James 3.17, But the wisdom that is from above, it tells you what wisdom is. When these men were chosen because they were full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, it tells us what the wisdom from above is like. It is first pure. We mentioned it before. These are men who are going to be working with single women. These are men who are going to be working with women who wish they were still married. The wisdom that is from above is first pure. You don't want somebody who's known for having playboy habits. You don't want somebody as a deacon who's known for running around. You don't want somebody as a deacon who's always flirting. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. That is he is always trying to pour oil on the waters. You know, these are people under pressure that have these needs. These are people that are always going to be stretching and straining and hard to make their ends meet. He's peaceable. He's gentle. He's easy to be entreated. He's full of mercy and good fruits. He's without partiality. He doesn't say, well, this widow's a prettier widow than that widow over there. I mean, she's really ugly and she has a nasty personality. You know, so I think I'll take care of the pretty one who has a sweet personality. He doesn't do that. Without partiality. Without hypocrisy. You see, when they gave this call for the deacons, a lot of people say, well, boy, that sure isn't very strong qualifications here. But the three qualifications that are given here and then that are expounded as Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3 so that he understands the implications of this, these are qualifications that cover the entire bowl of wax. These are men who are men of God. These are men who are faithful men. These are men who are honest men. These men are men who are bold in their witness. These men 
are pure and gentle and easy to be entreated and full of good fruits. They're full of mercy. They're without partiality. They're without hypocrisy. Those are the men that are brought before the apostles that are searched out of the congregation. And it's rather interesting that out of a congregation that size, we only found seven men with those qualifications. Being a deacon is a very high honor in the sight of God. It's a very high qualification that God sets for it because it is going to be ministering to some of the weakest members of the body. It's going to be an honorable office because it's going to be dealing with the financial resources of the church. Whenever you look for deacons, don't just say, who in the world can we get that, you know, is walking and breathing and can actually come and count? That, that is not the way the New Testament views it. It's not a matter of who's the best businessman, who has the most money, who has the most clout in town. It's a man who meets the spiritual qualifications that God has set forth. Well, our time is up, but let me just mention that the last two things that we see here in relation to the deacons is these are going to be men who are in submission to apostolic authority. It says, whom we may appoint over this business. And then finally, men who recognize that the ministry is an obligation. You know, they're going to be putting a lot of time in this. It's a responsibility that has to be fulfilled and cannot be taken lightly. Notice that phrase, whom we may appoint over this business. The word that's used there is a fairly rare word in the New Testament, crea. It's the word that means employment. Whom we may appoint over this employment. You know, it's not just the idea, yeah, this business. We're talking about something that is a highly responsible position in the body of Christ. Well, Lord willing, we'll pick it up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your word and for its power and for the opportunity that we've had here tonight to study it. We pray for your blessings upon the word of God as it's gone forth, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For this is your word. And here we find the church at its inception being attacked by Satan, first from the outside, and when he couldn't win there, he began to attack from the inside and actually caused some sin in the church. And yet, Father, you moved the apostles very wisely to delegate some authority in an area which would free them up for further spiritual ministry and which produced, as we see at the end of this passage, great spiritual results and growth in the church. So, Father, we pray for your blessings upon this church that you will help us to seek men who do qualify for the offices that are listed for us and that, Father, you would glorify yourself and cause great revival here in this place, great energy, great going forth of the Word of God that your people would be blessed, that your word would go forth, and that Jesus Christ would receive the honor, the glory, and the praise. For we pray it in his name. Amen.